We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. These words from the Declaration of Independence are familiar to many of us, and yet it took 143 years for women to get the right to vote, and 189 years for black people to get the right to vote. And still today, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness are still only words for many people. Here in Boston, Life expectancy varies by 30 years, depending on where you live. In Roxbury, with many poor and black people, life expectancy is 59 years. In the Back Bay, wealthy and mostly white, life expectancy is 91 years. It's tough to have liberty when you are in prison. The United States incarcerates 716 people for every 100,000 people. Our rate of incarceration is more than five times higher than most countries in the world. Millions of people in our country don't have health care, a decent job, good education, a home they can't afford, and that makes it pretty hard to pursue happiness. So on this show, you are going to meet people who are making it possible to have life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. People today who are making the words of the Declaration of Independence come true. Hello, welcome to uh, We Hold These Truths. My name is Michael Jacoby Brown, and we're very blessed and honored to have as our host today, Ron Bell, the founder of Dunk the Vote, an important voter registration and voter turnout organization that works on civic engagement in the greater Boston area. Welcome, Ron. We're really glad to see you today. And uh, I'd like you to say something about where you grew up and what that was like for you growing up here in Boston. Sure. Um, first of all, thank you, Michael, for having me as a guest on We Hold These Truths. Uh, unfortunately, we haven't been able to uh, hold a lot of them true, but we got to keep on striving and keep pushing until Amen. we get the prize. But um, I grew up in Boston's Mission Hill neighborhood, which is a <laughs> sub-neighborhood of Roxbury. Um, you know, I, my mom and dad, um, my mom was a, a um, community activist uh, and also worked with young people in the Boston public schools as a, a bus monitor. And my father was a welder and uh, a baker, um, and as well as a veteran. And it, it was interesting. We had uh, three boys and three girls that grew up in the house, and many people referred to us as the Brady Bunch, but we were the Bell Bunch, you know. <laughs> and and it was so uh, we were very fortunate to grow up in a neighborhood that was rich in diversity. It had a mixed housing stock and a concentration of institution. Uh, we had black, white, Latinos, everything in between. Growing up, it was like a bowl of salad. So, at an early age, we were able to get the uh, education of folks uh, from different cultures. Uh, Mission Park, one of the best neighborhoods to grow up in, which is a part of Boston's Mission Hill. Um, uh, fast forward, I you know, was able to attend Boston Latin School. Unfortunately, uh, it was during the tough time in the city of Boston, very turbulent times. Um, you know, the busing of the 70s where you know, blacks and whites were, you know, going at each other. And, you know, I can remember it vividly uh, being called the N-word at one of the oldest public schools in the uh, country by a teacher. I was called the N-word. And I never forget that moment because here I am at a school that I didn't really want to go to. My mom really was, you know, adamant about me getting a good education and going to an exam school. And during the time, that I was uh, accepted into Boston Latin School was right during the time of the affirmative action. And, you know, during that time, you know, Blacks were able to get in pretty much like leveling the playing field. And so I thought that, you know, I was one of the affirmative action young people that <laughs> as a student, man, I, um, for the number of years, I, I, I felt that way and until 40 years later, I was, uh, a part of a group called the Boss uh, Black Alumni Advisory Committee for Boston Latin School, which are black <laughs> alumni who came back to deal with a racist incident in the Boston Latin School by two girls, Maggie, Noel, and Kyle. 
Kylie, Kylie, um, two young black girls who really exposed the racism there. And at that moment, you know, I went back to the time I was called the N word. And one of the lessons I learned, Michael, is that you can't put a band aid on racism. Um, you know, when 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 whenever you encounter racial uh, acts, and you know, even in this moment in this pandemic with George Floyd, I still remember being called the N word. I still remember being spit on by young uh, black, um, um, white teenage boys when I was nine years old. I remember that being spit on, going to Cub this Cub Scout singing "My Liberty, My My Country's uh, Tears of Thee, Sweet Land of Liberty," and and I'm on this show. We hold these truths. I still can smell the spit every Wednesday being spit on by white teenage boys, and I'm nine years old. So when we fast forward as my life growing up, I've always been one to fight for racial equality, social justice. You know, it was it's, it's the fire in my belly I get from my mom who founded mm -hmm. the neighborhood we grew up in, Roxbury Tenants of Harvard. Um, which her and her neighbors organized, you know, you know, going to meetings with her children. And we're in the gym while my mother's organizing a neighborhood where we eventually um, lived in. Um, so I know I'm jumping back and forth, but this no, is a cool. part of my journey. Um, and my journey has become my vocation, fighting for voter registration, fighting for social uh, equality and fighting for education and economic uh, opportunities for black people in particular. And I say that because as an African descendant of slave, I feel we always get the short end, end of the stick. You know, when you look at Boston and you look at disparities, which was pointed out in the intro there, the uh, the average net worth of a black family, $8, compared to a white family, $257,000. I thought that number was like, did they make it up? But no. anyway, um, you know, so I continue to fight. And as my journey going to RTH, as my journey, uh, uh, becoming the youth director, becoming the uh, youth council president at the age of 16, and then becoming the youth director of an organization my mom founded, um, um, I am very proud to say that I have continued her legacy. My dad was more or less like George Jefferson and um, Fred Sanford, who had the community laughing. Um, I guess he worked so many hours working two full-time jobs he had nothing else to do but make us laugh and take care of his family. So, yeah. I mean, I can continue on. I want to make sure I don't want to take up the whole no, time. That's great. But I can continue no, that, tell my that's story. Great. I mean, I know you were the youngest director of the Mission Hill Community Center. And I know uh, that was during the time of uh, uh, the murder where a white man murdered his wife and right. said falsely that it had been a black man. The, so-called Stewart case. I wonder if you can talk about what your experience was like then uh, in Mission Hill as the youngest director of the Mission Hill Community Center and what you learned from that. Yeah, well, you know, interesting, uh, after leaving the Roxbury Tin Sahaba Youth Director, I became the uh, assistant director at Mission Hill Community Center, which only lasted about six months. And then, and, and then I actually was initiated in to the executive director uh, with the Stewart tragedy, when a pregnant white woman, uh, as you mentioned, Mike, was allegedly killed by a African American male. There was an all-out hunt for black men. Now, I'm mind mind you, I'm just becoming the director and the youngest director at the age of 26, um, and you know, having 80 staff servicing a thousand people a day, um, it was really a major challenge. And, and 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 and, but I'm proud that I was able to handle it. Um, but I remember vividly, Michael, uh, seeing black men being strip searched right in front of the center. And I was walking down Tremont Street, which is where the Toba Community Center is located in Mission Hill. Right. And I see these black men with their pants pulled down, some laid on the ground in front of the center. I remember turning around um, because I did not want to be subjected to that as a new director because it wasn't like it, it didn't matter if you was executive director. It didn't matter if you had a suit or tie. It didn't matter if you was a doctor, lawyer. It was a bad time, uh, a, a terrible, turbulent time in the city of Boston. Um, and I felt helpless at that moment, but I realized 
in order to exact punishment um, on elected officials did not stand with us during that challenging time, seeing young black men being strip searched and then come up to uh, find out it was her own husband that did it. Um, it was like we had to do something. And so we started organizing voter registration drives at local storefronts. Unfortunately, the black men who were being strip searched weren't coming out to the drive. So what better way to reach them? Um, in community organizing, we know that the best extras are those closest to the problem, but we also got to meet people where they are. And so we met these young black men where they are through the sport of basketball. And that was the niche to bring them into the gymnasium. It was the niche to be able to bring community based organizations, health care is what we do on uh, uh, health care, where we check people's high blood pressure, blood pressure, cholesterol. Check. It was a one stop shop, Michael, where it was just. <laughs> We registered 1,500 people in three days. And you wow. know, it was such an exciting moment for us. And then we fast forward into uh, developing a leadership institute and we registered over 50,000 people over the years and the counting. Um, so that's been my journey at Missional Community Center. Now, mind you, that was just one of the many programs that we did from early intervention all the way to senior citizens. So it was a family service center and a community, uh, uh, folks building relationships and getting to know we were a big family. We, uh, I would believe it would be similar what Dr. King and, you know, and Dr. Virgil Wood, who had the opportunity to speak to the other day called the beloved community. So I guess I got that spirit in me. No, I, I know you do. I wonder if you can talk about some of your mentors and what you, learned and how you learned about organizing at the Mission Hill Community Center and after that. Uh, I know you also led a reenactment of the Selma to Montgomery March that John Lewis and other, uh, others joined. And I wonder if you can talk about what you learned from that experience and who were some of the key mentors and teachers for you now that you yourself, uh, not that you're that old, but are mentoring many other young people. Yeah, well, I just had a birthday the other day. So I don't, know. Don't, 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 <laughs> happy don't happy birthday, Michael. You're um, still a lot younger than I am. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I um, no, I uh, there, there's a number of mentors. Um, some older and some younger. Um, because I think we can always we're always learning. Um, mm -hmm. well, one I would say Hubie Jones, who's dean emeritus at Boston University, as mm -hmm. well as a dean at City Year. Hubie's been very supportive of of me. Um, um, in my work, he uh has encouraged me to kind of focus in on what do I really want to do? What is my brand? And I continue to talk to Hubie, um, not as much as I used to, um, you know, uh, but I still check in with him. Mel King, who forms the Honorable Mel King, um, who was the formerly a state rep, as well as the South End Technology Center. He's, he works there in the South End uh, as well. Uh, MIT, he has a fellowship, which I went through. Um, these gentlemen were two key folks that I learned many things from. Um, I remember Mel coming over to the community center um, during the time um, when I had just became the executive director in the first year of Dunk the Vote. And I remember when he was telling me, he said, this is what we need here. You know, civic engagement. This is what we need people to be able to come to a place that feels as if this is home, a second home. Um, and so there are other mentors yourself, Michael, you've been uh, a very uh, instrumental in my life. Um, and I have something here, <laughs> <laughs> building powerful community organizations. So I take a peek in there uh, every now and then, if folks can see this. <laughs> this uh, is your uh, time, Ron. Huh? This is your time. Okay, well, we had a little technical difficulty, and uh, we're back with Ron Bell, the founder and executive director of Dunk the Vote. Ron, I know you mentioned earlier about your experience at Boston Latin School, and you said 40 years later you found out something. You said during the time you were there, there was some interest in affirmative action, but what was the actual situation that you found out 40 years later? You didn't actually get to mention that. Yeah, I um again uh, I I was talking to you about the experience uh, with the two young black girls who identified uh, the racial activity that was going on at Boston Latin, 
uh, Maggie uh, Noels and Kylie Webster. Uh, these two young women, brilliant, black, beautiful queens who uh, really brought something to light. And I joined a, a committee called the Black Alumni Advisory Committee, which were alumni of Boston Latin. And Michael Conopasis, who was the headmaster when I was in, thank God they changed that name to heads of school. Um, right. That name doesn't, you know, signify what your your show does. These truths, right? Um, mm -hmm. So anyway, so he, um, uh, we were going around and, and, and introducing ourselves, and I said I was uh, a, one of the young people who came into Boston Latin during busing in '76 during the affirmative action. And we had a number of blacks and um, uh, Latinos that came in during that time. So I thought I was a young person that was able to receive that benefit as, of affirmative action. And he said, no, Ron, no, you wasn't one of them. You actually had the highest scores uh, amongst the students who were enrolled, which included the black, white, Latino and everything else uh, in between that. And I was like, wow. For 40 years, I thought I was an affirmative action uh, student who graduated from Latin in 1981. And when I when he said that, it was like a weight lifted off my shoulder. And, mm -hmm. and that goes to talk that goes to tell you about how, you know, you can't believe everything you read or see. You have to know it for yourself. And when he told me that it made me feel a, a level of being proud. I, I felt very proud um, and I yeah. felt like, wow, you know. <laughs> I was one of the top candidates who got the highest score. So that was something that really um, was a, a tipping point in my life. Um, I would also uh, submit to you a, another lesson when we talk about schools as we, you know, move forward these 40 plus years now. Um, when I started uh, Dunk the Vote um, in 19. 89, I was the executive director at Mission Hill Community Centers. And one of the lessons that I learned was how to be a community organizer. You know, because mm -hmm. so, so many of us, you know, we say that we're community organizers, but we really don't know the the uh, different pieces that go along with community organizing, like building relationship and fighting for power and getting to know our neighbors face to face and talking to one another. And I remember right. a woman by the name of Jean Neville, God yeah. rest her soul, um, rest in peace. Uh, she was one of the organizers who helped fight, uh, start Roxbury Tents of Harvard, where her and my mom and others, neighbors, uh, some students from Harvard University fought Harvard to get affordable housing for our community. And she kept saying to me, Ron, you have to learn the difference from a community organizer and an executive director. Because so often, you know, I was the executive director. I actually was the youngest director in the department. There were uh, 41 facilities and I had two facilities. I was 26, 27 years old. And, and she kept saying that, you know, let me teach you how to be a community organizer. First of all, you need to go to your neighbors, knock on these doors. Um, and it's not about you. It's about organizing people and getting them to take power. Um, a lot of us use the word we need to empower people. She taught me that you don't empower people. You you teach people how to take power. And, and I kept saying to myself, you know, I'm so used to, you know, I'm the executive director. Then you have your assistant sure. director and my 80 staff. And and I remember we had lost like a couple of staff members during that time with a program called Hope and Progress. We had 250 young people. There were incidents in our center. One of the centers we had found an AK-47 pistol. And, and, and we kept saying to the administration in the city of Boston that we needed more to, to replace these staff. We needed a security uh, in one of my facilities, which was in the heart of uh, the housing development in Mission Hill. And I remember knocking on the doors to parents that grew up with me and, and asked them to come to a community meeting. And lo and behold, we had 97 people. And I and then the my supervisor, the executive director of Boston Centers for Youth and Families, which is actually back then was Boston Community Centers, I had her and her entourage came in front of 97 people telling them that there was no money in the budget 
Um, at the time, I was one of the organizers for the union. And in, in our president uh, at the time, Bishop William Dickinson, um, he had asked, he was also the president of our board. He had asked all those in favor of the administration leaving this facility because they cannot deliver our the, the resources we need, we were going to go directly to the mayor to stand up. And out of the 99 people that that attended the meeting, it was 99 people that attended the meeting, 97 of them stood up and asked the administration. Now, mind you, this is my boss, the, the supervisor, and her staff, which was about eight of them, to leave the facility. Right then and in that moment, Michael, I learned about power. I learned mm -hmm. about my community took power and we were able to get the resources we need. We got the three staff. As a matter of fact, we ended up getting four because Mass College of Art at the time, no, Mass College of Pharmacy provided us with additional staff. So we had four staff and a police officer. So again, no one could ever tell me that, you know, people working together, organizing together with a common interest can really accomplish the goal. Right. So I know after the Stewart case, you talked about uh, Dunk the Vote, getting young, especially young black men together to uh, play basketball. And in order to play basketball, they had to register to vote and vote. And now uh, here it is years later, you're uh, revitalizing Dunk the Vote. Can you tell us a little about what you hope to achieve in the next steps for Dunk the Vote now? Yes. Yeah. Dunk the Vote is um, going through a major transition right now. And I, I took a, a somewhat a breathing period. I, I ended up working as senior advisor to Governor Deval Patrick as his uh, senior advisor for community affairs. So that kind of took me off track. I be, went from nonpartisan to a partisan effort because one of the reasons I did that was because we were able to get jobs for black people. And, and, and Latinos and, and women and, and, and those that are on a, the low spectrum of the totem pole, so to speak. And during that time, you know, I learned about the inside. And in learning about the inside, um, I also learned how to organize from the middle, being on the inside and being an organizer on the outside and having connections on both and bringing that together to make sure I continue to deliver for my community. After I left the administration, I realized that Dunk the Vote was such a there was such a uh, a leadership gap in our community. And you know, when you look at the daunting statistics of the net worth of a, a black family eight dollars compared to a white family two hundred and uh, forty seven thousand two hundred fifty around that uh, figure, um, you ha we have to do something around economic opportunities. So we were able to. Uh, you know, get some of the folks who've been very active in Dunk the Vote, and particularly black men uh, and women, uh, to organize and to mobilize and to uh, really develop their leadership skills. Even during this pandemic, we were uh, we had our PPP gear, and we declared this past year, vote, Dunk the Vote 2020, as a uh, voting is a public health emergency. And so we were still out on the ground, but we brought the ground game to the social media space. One other area that I work in is, is communications. I run a broadcast on Milton Access TV as well as Boston Black News and Boston Parades Radio and TV. And I use them outlets, one, to use as an educational form uh, where we're able to uh, implement our one of our projects called CEL, Civic Engagement Leadership Lab, which entails providing information for young people. Then visit our website at uh, dunkthevote2020.com. It's so important that we get all people involved because I know we've been, we, we were able to organize it, uh, at it um, from a, an issue that happened in our community, a very bad issue, the Stewart tragedy. But we realize that it's not just black people that we're reaching out to, we're reaching out to all people because when you help, uh, and particularly folks who've been here uh, and brought here against the real African descendants of slaves is better for all of us. So now what we're doing, we've expanded to eight different uh, states. We have a physical, uh, a, a present zoomed into various uh, states across the country, including battleground states like Pennsylvania, Arkansas, um, 
you know, uh, we were also have a presence in Florida and California and in North Carolina, South Carolina, and 12 cities across the Commonwealth. And we're really zeroing in to uh, make sure that we focus in neighborhoods and uh, particularly in areas where I have done uh, work and, and dunk the vote volunteers and staff that are paid, I might add, um, so that we're able to kind of measure our success. And we're asking folks to join Dunk the Vote, uh, $20 per year. We're asking people to join our organization to continue to keep the flame flickering. Um, this year, 2021, uh, we know there are a number of races here locally. Uh, there's races going nationally in various states that we're in. Uh, and we're going to do our thing. Um, we're asking people to organize their blocks, their communities, stay active. We've declared uh, civic engagement is a, uh, a public health emergency, civic engagement. I think sometimes, Michael, we tend to work on these elections, and particularly some I've worked on, whether it's been Deval Patrick's or Obama's. And, you know, we, we get all excited. You know, we get candidates that look like us, that, that somewhat think like us um, and have our uh, best interests at heart. And we stop and we don't want to stop. We need to keep people right. engaged, make civic engagement a way of life. Right. And why is it so important to have a membership organization where people pay dues, support the organization? Why, why is that so critical to the future of Dunk the Vote? Well, it's, it's important. Well, you can't depend on grant money. Grant money comes, it goes away. Um, when you have a membership, people are invested in themselves, they invest mm -hmm. in their future. They're also invested in an organization that builds power and economic opportunities. So they know there's a place they can go. They can go to Dunk DeVoe Cell, Civic Engagement Leadership Lab, and find information. They can call on others. We're building a family. We're building what, you know, Dr. King um, called the beloved community. I, as I mentioned before, Dr. Virgil Woods, who's one of my mentors, talks about the importance of building relationships, the importance of building a beloved community. And when you invest in something, you take pride in it. Even when I was the executive director at Mission Hill Community Centers, we had a membership. Dunk the Vote was a part of Mission Hill Community Centers. And when people pay for something, they pay attention to what's going right. on. And then they, they have value it. Right. Exactly. And, and like you say, the grants may come and go, though the foundations will often love you and leave you. Uh, and often and you what I think. The what's you that? love the foundation. Oh, you yeah. love foundation. And I think I think the thing that you're doing and maybe you could we only have about a minute left is why is it so important that this be an ongoing organization that it not just flare up a few weeks or months before an election. Why is that so important that it be ongoing and 24-7, 365 days a year, year after year? Why is that so critical in about, you know, one minute think, or less? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I think the the quote that Dr. King always says, and it sums it all up, and, and I'm very cautiously, cautiously optimistic about our future and the turning point which our country's in, that the moral arc of the universe is long, but it bends towards justice. So I continue to ask people to let's keep going in the right direction. Right. And and the other thing you mentioned uh, is about how Dunk the Vote's a family. Can you just say what that means to you and how the members will be a family? Well, uh, you know, I, um, I, I, as I mentioned, I, I, I get the, 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 the fire in my belly from my mom and I, right. I believe in relationships. I believe in folks looking out for each other. It's in my DNA. Um, right. So it makes me feel I'm doing my part. It makes me feel I'm a part of a family uh, that makes me happy. Well, thanks, Ron. It's a really honor and a privilege to have you on We Hold These Truths because you are building, you are making those truths that were said in paper or on parchment in the Declaration of Independence come real in 2021 and in the years ahead. So this is Michael Jacoby Brown signing off for We Hold These Truths. I'm the host. We were very lucky to have uh, Ron Bell, the director and founder of Dunk the Vote, so go to his website, Dunk the Vote 2020, and join. This is your time to make a difference. Thank you very much. <laughs>